Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Preparedness Podcast, the podcast that brings you the best in preparedness information. You can reach us online at thepreparednesspodcast.com. My name is Rob Hannes, and I'm the host for the show. You can email me, if you'd like, at rob at prepcast.info. If you haven't taken the listener survey yet, I would encourage you to head on over to the website and click on the little button on the left-hand side that says listener survey. Uh, I actually haven't taken it myself, but there is a bunch of questions on there about, I think, your listening habits, and most importantly, at least for me, is the uh, the likes and the dislikes, and you can go ahead and put some text in there and let us know what you like and, and what you don't like. Uh, it's completely anonymous, so not going to know it's you, but it does give us some um, important feedback. Likewise, if you listen to us on iTunes, um, and if you would like to leave a rating, I would appreciate it. It's a way for other people to kind of find us. And I'm not exactly sure how the, uh, the iTunes algorithm works, but I, I have a feeling that the more that people fill out ratings and stuff, the more likely that other people will also find the podcast. I'd like to mention that I have three new videos on uh, YouTube. Uh, I am putting the podcast on there on a regular basis, but uh, I have put three videos from when I was testing Faraday containers. Um, you can see all three of those up on there now. You can also hit them by going to the website, and um, if you search for EMP, they should be the last three postings on EMP. Also, if EMP is uh, something you're trying to learn about and get ready for, uh, you know, go ahead and check out the um, the mini guide I have on surviving EMP. Uh, you can. Find it on Amazon by searching for Preparedness Podcast or go to the website and the sticky post at the top of the homepage. Uh, you can find the um, article right there. Uh, basically, what I've done is I've taken all the information I've given on the podcast and the website and the videos, uh, and I've expounded on it a little bit where I didn't actually have the time to do so in, in either of these media. And basically, I put it all together in one place so that you can download it and have it with you and, and be able to uh, learn about it and be able to uh, protect your stuff. So go ahead and check that out. Also, I wanted to point out that I did an interview with uh, BHK Outdoor Radio. This is the uh, Blind Horse Knives uh, guys, uh, LT and Dan. They uh, they also do the Self-Reliance Illustrated magazine. Uh, that was a good time. So uh, if you get a chance, go ahead and check that out. It's only about 30 minutes long. We're going to be covering some current events um, for this week of November 11th, 2012. And um, part of this is going to be glimpsing into a disaster aftermath, which I think you could probably figure out is is talking about some of the things that we're seeing in the aftermath of Sandy. And I think this is important because, again, this is one of those rare times that we get to look at the aftermath of a major disaster and learn from it. It's important to be able to... Uh, grab these lessons where we can and major disasters are one way to take a look at not only how we can become better prepared but also what the the social impacts are how do people respond how are people handling it and i think in some cases this is actually more important than uh, learning what happens in the disaster from the the disaster event itself because it's the people that have to deal with the aftermath and i think that uh, we can learn a lot, uh, so we're going to be covering some of that in a little bit. Before we jump into that, though, I want to talk about our first sponsor, Flying Eagle Gold. I think we have covered this so that um, old listeners are probably familiar with it, but we have a lot of new listeners, and one of the important aspects to um, keep in mind about the economy and inflation and, and where the dollar may be going is that the dollar is basically fake money. It only has value because those people that accept it agree to accept it for a certain amount of value. However, I'm sure as you've been shopping lately, you've noticed that we're being hit by inflation. In fact, I think that we are in the very beginning stages of hyperinflation. And what that means is that the dollar will be buying less and less and less. So one of the ways that you can um, mitigate this is to invest your current dollars uh, into tangible goods and tangible goods that aren't likely to um, dwindle in value. And, and 
One of those is, is gold and silver, quite honestly, because gold and silver has always held its value for thousands of years. If you look at any of the uh, recent or even the past um, hyperinflationary events, you'll see that gold and silver become the currency of the day. Now, I'm sure you have heard the saying that you can't eat gold, and this is very true. However, you know, unless you're planning for a Mad Max scenario, which I do not think you should be preparing for because I don't see a Mad Max scenario actually happening, especially not for an economic event. There's going to be commerce. There's going to be business. There always is. If you look at all the past hyperinflationary events and all the past economic collapses and, and dollar collapses or money collapses, there's always business. There's always people still conducting commerce. So you need to have a way to be able to interact with this commerce or be able to preserve your wealth until they figure out exactly what they're going to do with the money and, and start issuing new currency or whatever it is they're going to do. Now, I'm not saying you should put all your savings into gold and silver. I'm saying that you should consider putting some of your savings into gold and silver so that you have some sort of wealth preservation uh, in place. Uh, you can find out more information on flyingeaglegold.com. Uh, there's a navigation down on the right. Uh, you, you can drill down and find the information or find the answers to the questions that you have. And uh, when you're ready, give Jeff a call, and he'll be able to help you determine you know, what the best plan might be for you. So, again, that's flyingeaglegold.com, or if you're on the Preparedness Podcast website, you'll see the banner. Just click on it, and you go right there. So, Sandy. The aftermath. What exactly are we seeing? Now, hopefully, you've been, you've been paying attention to uh, the news stream that's been coming out of the area because, you know, you're not going to find all the information uh, that you might be interested in in one newscast. And if you did, it'd probably be very, very long and take a long time to read. And who has time for that? Another really interesting aspect of, of this sort is uh, all the photo essays that are out there. There are some really good ones out there. And those photo essays can, well, as they say, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. You can look at these pictures and find out what the damage is. Uh, you can find out what people are doing, how they are living. Um, in some cases, you know, how badly or, or how well they're coping. And you can you can glean a lot of information from it. And again, as I said, I think a lot of what you should be studying is how people are reacting to this. Because again, this is not uh, a, a one-time or I should say a, a short sort of duration thing. I mean, the, the hurricane came, hit, and now it's been, what, a couple weeks now, I think, since it's hit. And there are still people who are dealing with this. And they're going to be dealing with this for, for quite a while. So some of the things that I've noticed included, of course, destroyed homes, no electricity, food spoilage, uh, no food or clean water or lack of, you know, a clean water. They've got some, but, well, actually, there's water all over the place, but it's not clean. I mean, it's floodwaters. Uh, there's no sanitation. I mean, let's be honest. Where are people pooping? If they've got no water and the sanitation is not flowing. I mean, you've got millions of people. Where are they going? That, that's just adding to the sanitation issue. There was one article I saw, and I thought I had archived it. I, I can't find it now, so I can't reference it. But it basically was talking about um, how people were just kind of going to the bathroom or wherever. And this was what they were referencing was uh, an apartment complex. And you know, apparently the, the plumbing wasn't working, so they were just going, you know, someplace. Uh, you need to consider that, especially if you live in an apartment or a condo or some sort of um, housing development where you're in close proximity to other people. But honestly, even single family homes in your typical suburban neighborhood, you know, walk outside and just look at all the houses that are around there and say to yourself, okay. No water, no running water, no sanitation. Um, think about how many times people go to the bathroom every day and now think, okay, where are these people going to be going? Sure, some of people like you and other prepared people might either, you know, dig a slit trench or a cat hole or have uh, buckets and garbage bags or a porta potty, you know, one of those little chemical toilets. But you know that most people aren't prepared. So, 
one of the often overlooked aspects of disasters is sanitation. And uh, so where are these people going and how is it going to affect you? I mean, if your neighbor decides to dump his body waste just outside or just the other side of your fence or near your property line, you know, what does that do not only for the smell, but for, for disease and uh, rodents and vermin and stuff like that? We've seen violence, anger, and rage in the streets. We've seen people without any heat or warmth. We've seen people without money. Uh, we've seen a lot of people who are sitting around waiting for FEMA and governments to, quote, save them, end quote. Um, we have energy generation and transportation issues, which means we have little or no fuel. Uh, electric cars are completely worthless. I mean, if you don't have liquid fuel to run your car, if it's one of those cars that has to plug in uh, to get your you know, 40 miles a day out of it, uh, where, where are you charging your car? You, you don't have that issue. This is a huge impact for people who are trying to go with electric cars. They're, gonna, they're finding out that, you know, there is no... Um, alternative infrastructure for them. So these are just some of the, the things that I've noticed. Now, I've got a couple notes here on some um, some articles, and a lot of these repeat. So I only took, took a few out of all the ones I had collected just to kind of go over. One of the things that we saw recently was that New York City started to ration gas, and they went back to the system that I remember from the 70s where – License plates that ended in an odd number can fill up on odd days, and license plates that start ended with an even uh, could, you know, uh, fill up on even days. Even with this gas rationing, I think this was more of a feel-good measure by the by the mayor of New York City because uh, there are a lot of gas stations that are still out of order. They don't have gas or they don't have electricity. Uh, people you know, can't get around very well. So um, even though this, that you have this odd, even sort of rationing, uh, it doesn't apply to a lot of people because they still have to stand in line with their little gas can to get their, their allotment of gas um, whenever they can. And uh, this article also um, was saying that uh, it's, it's expected that uh, they're going to have gas shortages for the next couple of weeks, which you know, if you think about it, uh, that includes next week, which is Thanksgiving week. So you're having a lot of people who are homeless or near homeless because their home is destroyed or do doesn't electricity and they're still having to deal with this. And we've got, a, you know, a national holiday coming up. For this next article, the headline is Fear of Looting Grips New York City as New Storm Threatens. Now, this was last week, but I'm including it this week because, well, one, I didn't do a current events last week, but... Um, I think it's important to realize because sometimes I think it gets glossed over, especially in the mainstream media, because it's, you know, it's not really something they want to talk about. Or maybe the city's put a hush hush on. I don't know. But looting is always rampant uh, in disasters like this, especially in urban areas. And so um, this article is talking about how there are a lot of people who are deciding to stay home when they should probably be leaving. In fact, the police are going through the neighborhoods and telling people to leave. But they don't want to because they, you know, they can't take everything with them. So they decide to stay there because they know that if they if they leave it, uh, the looters are going to come. And in many cases, um, looters and burglars are breaking down doors and, and entering homes with people that are still there. Um, and you know they're getting kind of caught. Both parties are kind of surprised because the looters didn't expect them to be there. So it's important to realize that when this happens, you're going to have that criminal element come out. And so this is why a lot of preppers, uh, we always talk about self-defense. We always talk about, you know what, you should be able to defend yourself, preferably with a gun, because there is no other form of self-defense that evens the tables or evens the odds with um, – your opponent and this being, you know, the bad guy, looter slash burglar, murder, rapist, whatever he may be, you know, you could have sticks and tasers and, and stun guns and, and sprays and stuff, but there is no greater equalizer than a firearm. And so if you live in an area that allows to have firearms, you should, you should have one, you should get the training and you should learn how to use it to protect yourself. Now in this article, there is one guy that they're talking about where he's defending his, his home, with uh, swords or a sword and knives because that's all he has, which 
I suppose, is better than nothing. Uh, but again, you should know the laws uh, of anything you choose to protect yourself with and make sure that you're well within your rights to be able to defend yourself and how you choose to defend yourself. This next article uh, deals with the fact that when you have flood water around you in your home, um, on you if you have to wade through it or whatever, uh, it's really nasty stuff. And you need to keep in mind that it's it's not like river water. Uh, I, I was in a flood once and it was because um, a river had overflowed its banks through hours and hours and hours of endless heavy rain. And even though it was the uh, the river that had um, bust through its banks, it was still filled with, with chemicals and gasoline and oil and raw sewage. Um, and so you've got, you know, all these infectious organisms and you've got bacteria. Um, you've got all this, all these waterborne diseases, uh, typhoid fever, cholera, um, even West Nile virus with the mosquitoes and stuff. You need to be careful. You can't just, you can't just rinse your hands off in, in, in flood water, shake them off, and, and then go eat because you're, you're probably going to get sick. It's some of the nastiest stuff out there. Uh, you can treat this water, but you have to be very careful. You, you have to basically you know filter it a bunch of times to get all the um, uh, sediment out of there. And even then, you're still dealing with chemicals, and the chemicals are really difficult to get rid of. Uh, sometimes you can filter them with a good uh, charcoal filter. Uh, but you still need to be very, very careful. It's far easier to use stored water than to have to resort to using uh, flood water. Uh, again, you can if you need to, but you got to be very careful to make sure that you um, filter out everything. You're going to want to sh- uh, treat it with uh you know, chlorine or iodine to make sure you kill everything. And then you need to make sure that not just a uh, sediment filter, not just a like a, you know, a matrix fiber filter, not just a, a ceramic filter, but it needs to be a charcoal filter to, to pull out as much chemicals as possible because this is some of the nastiest stuff you can ever think of. Okay, so I know I'm going to get uh, questions and emails and comments saying, okay, what would you do to filter out flood water? So I'm just going to go ahead and address it right here. Um, This is what I would do if I had no other choice. Now, keep in mind, no other choice. It's a choice between uh, dying of dehydration or dehydrating to a point where I'm I'm severely sick or, you know, using flood water um, because the reason I say that is because if I used flood waters in my filters, uh, when things got back to better, I'd probably have to throw – I would probably – feel best if I threw those filters out and replaced them. And some of these filters can be expensive. So not only would I uh, want to try to have um, stored water on hand as much as possible, uh, use whatever I can do, use before this, uh, that's what I would do. However, if I had no choice, this is what I would do. Uh, And assuming, of course, I had taken the preps ahead of time to be able to do this. Now, first I would... um, get some buckets of this water. Uh, I would try to take it from as clean an area as possible, which may not be possible, but you know, I wouldn't dip it right into an area that I could see the rainbow sheen of oil and gas on top of the water. I would try to find some place that, that I couldn't see that. Uh, I would let that water sit uh, for as long as possible and try to have those sediments drop to the bottom as much as possible. Then I would uh, try to filter this water through um, t T-shirts or, or you know pillowcases or some sort of cotton cloth like sheets, any sort of tightly woven material, I would filter through several layers of that, and I would do it several times until I got that running as clear as possible. After that, I would probably consider running it through some coffee filters if I had any, because that's actually a finer media, and the reason I would probably do that is because. Um, I want to get out as much of the large sediment as possible. That makes my filters more efficient. My filters don't have to filter out the big stuff. They can be much more effective at filtering out the the little stuff, even if that means I don't have to clean the filter as often because they're getting clogged. Then what I would do is I would take some of um, some bleach. Uh, ideally, I would make it from 
um, some calcium hypochlorite crystals. That way I knew I had some fresh bleach and I would shock that water that was there. Uh, why would I do this before filter? Well, because I want to, um, I want the best water I can get. And right now, if, if I made my own bleach, it's, it's cheap and plentiful. So I might as well. Then I'm going to uh, pour it into probably um, a Berkey or some sort of gra uh, gravity fed filter that had a uh, charcoal filter in there and was rated for uh, the uh, heavy metals and the volatile organic compounds. Uh, these are your, your chemicals that you're trying to take out of the water. Uh, if not a gravity fed, then I would use a hand pump that did the same thing. Now, the important aspect here is that the filter has to be rated um, for the VOCs, those, those organic compounds, because those are the chemicals that's going to be pulling out. And typically, this it, this means carbon. You need carbon to do this. There's very little filters that I'm aware of that can actually do as good a job as activated charcoal can. Now, this doesn't mean that you take a bag of charcoal briquettes and pulverize it and then pour the water through that. I would only do that if I didn't have anything else. Uh, it That is not the same as activated charcoal. It's not going to work anywhere near as well as uh, a real activated charcoal filter that's actually designed to pull this stuff out. Now, I prefer uh, a gravity or a drip filter system because they're much more time efficient. I'm not having to pump all the time. And that's why we have a, a, a Berkey sponsor on the site. So uh, head on over to the website and, and click on the on the, uh, the banner that's there, and you can find out all about the Berkey filters. After I filtered it through a charcoal filter, um, I would hit it again with chlorine, and I would make sure I let that stand for at least 30 minutes with the chlorine in there and made sure that I could uh, afterwards I could smell a slight bleach smell. At that point, then um, I may even, if I, if I had the fuel, I may even boil it just to make sure, because again, we're talking about the nastiest of the nastiest water ever, and I want to make sure that I don't have any issues with it. So um, even after I've hit it twice with chlorine, even though I put it through the filter, I, I may still boil it if fuel wasn't an issue just to make sure, because you know what? This is my wife and kids that are going to be drinking this water, and if they got sick, uh, I, I don't think there's anything that could, you know, wash away that guilt. So I'm going to make sure that it's absolutely good to go. Okay, moving on. Uh, the next one is, again, about the aftermath. And uh, the headline here is bitter cold inside a disaster shelter. Um, I'll Again, all the links for this will be in the show notes. So um, go ahead and, and hit them if you're interested in reading more. But this one is about people that are complaining because... Uh, they're not being helped enough inside this shelter, and it's a little bit too cold for them, and, um, you know, they're not getting enough help from FEMA or the government. You know, uh, pardon my, my cynicism here, but you know what? Um, if it wasn't for the little help that they were getting, uh, they would be dying outside of exposure because it's bitterly cold out there. Um, and, you know, not to mention the fact that they did absolutely nothing to help themselves. Um, I don't, I don't mean to pass judgment on people, but quite honestly, people who can't be bothered to take a minimal amount of preparations, especially when they're, you know, able-bodied and they've been forewarned and the commercials are on TV. I mean, I'm sure none of this is, is a surprise to people, especially when they have say, I don't know, four or five days notice that a hurricane is going to hit their area. I just don't understand when people don't say, you know what, maybe we should stock up food and water and maybe I should get some extra blankets and we should, you know, be ready just in case we have to evacuate or the house gets hit or whatever. I've never been able to understand that, that mentality. Um, but you know what, this is what you're going to see in the aftermath of a disaster. Uh, some people will just not comprehend that it happened or happened to them. Uh, some people are always looking for a handout. Some people are always, you know, looking for somebody else to help them instead of them helping themselves. Now, there's always reasons why somebody can um, need help. Uh, you know, maybe you have somebody who is really prepared and they're house and all their belongings got washed away or wiped away with the earthquake or the flood or the hurricane or whatever it is. Yes, that happens. Um, but you need to keep in mind that uh, you, there are people out there that are going to expect you, if you're the prepared one, to help them who 
aren't prepared and you need to be able to deal with that and um, looking at these people and how they react in disasters like this when you're not really directly involved with them can be a very big learning experience and so that you're not caught up um, in a surprise of, oh, you know what, I really want to help these people because, gosh, I really should help people and I don't want to see anybody suffer when the truth may be closer to, you know what, you really need to look out for yourself because these people are moochers and this is all they do, this is all they've ever done, and they're just looking for handouts. You need to be careful because it can go either way. And again, I don't want to say that you shouldn't help people because I think you should. I just also think you should be very smart about it to make sure that you're not putting yourself in harm's way or your family in harm's way by helping people who are just going to simply turn around and uh, either steal uh, or, or, you know, stabbing the back or whatever. You need to be careful. All right. Uh, moving beyond uh, the hurricane aftermath, um, the next one is going to sound political, but it really isn't. And I'll explain why. Uh, there is a article I came across. I actually think I came across it from survivalblog.com. And it's on the American Thinker, and basically it's headlined, The Mass Firings Begin. Now, this isn't the only place I've heard of this, but this is a fairly decent list. It kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. And um, what is happening, apparently what's happening from what I've been reading, is that uh, now that businesses know that Obamacare, their new health care system, is not going to be repealed or stopped or uh, slow down in any way, uh, they're having to make decisions based on the economy. Uh, they can't afford to keep the same number of people they have and the new health care laws that are coming in. So they're starting to lay off people to accommodate for these new costs. Now, again, I'm not trying to make this political because this is this is an economy uh, issue that we have to, to deal with because the more people that enter – you know, the unemployment sector of, uh, of society, you know, the worse the economy is. I mean, the economy is great when everybody's working. It's not so good the more people that aren't working. So uh, this link here has, I think, it lists probably 30 companies. And uh, just eyeballing this, looks like there's probably six, seven, maybe as much as 10,000 people that are being laid off. And this is just, you know, a, a small sampling of... Um, of companies that are, are doing this. So this is something that we're going to have to be looking forward or looking, looking at coming forward in the next year is how these things are affecting the economy. Because uh, as we've been talking about, you know, the economy is not getting better. And this is one of those red flag events that we need to say, huh? Yeah, that's definitely going to affect this. And I need to, again, be prepared for it. The second to the last article I want to cover is, Headlined, UN warns of looming worldwide food crisis in 2013. Now, this came out on October 13th, so it was uh, nearly a month ago. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised that this fell under my radar. Um, I, I did not see this come across any of my resources, so I was a little taken aback when I found out how... Now, it's not a very old article, but it was older than I would have expected... Uh, basically, what they're saying is that the world grain reserves are so dangerously low that severe weather in the United States or other food exporting countries could trigger a major hunger crisis next year, the United Nations warned. Now, that's the first paragraph of the article. It continues, failing harvests in the U.S., Ukraine, and other countries this year have eroded reserves to their lowest level since 1974. The U.S., which has experienced record heat waves and droughts in 2012, now holds in reserve a historically low 6.5% of the maize that it expects to consume in the next year, says the United Nations. Now, the article goes on to basically say that the reason that the reserves are low is because we're not producing as much as we're consuming, which, you know, is pretty logical that if, if you have a savings and you're not making enough to make your bills, you're going to start dipping into your savings to start paying your bills. Same thing with food. Again, this is an issue. We went through the severe droughts this last year uh, in the breadbasket. Uh, not to mention that a lot of our corn is, is made into fuel instead of food, uh, but with less less of the corn out there and the less of the wheat and stuff out there, we're having 
food issues. And keep in mind that wars are fought over food and water. So, uh, again, another red flag event that we need to basically look at and project forward and say, okay, how is this going to affect uh, my preparedness and how I should be prepared in the next year or two or three? And I think the obvious answer here is that food is cheap now. Uh, you should buy your food now, whether it's uh, you know the the ready-made meals from Legacy or um, bulk foods or freeze-dried or um, dehydrated or dehydrate your own. But whatever you want to do is, I think you need to act now. Maybe uh, put some away some turkeys and chickens and some, and some Cornish hens this Thanksgiving or whenever they go on sale, because as as time goes on, I think we're going to have. Uh, greater food shortages and higher prices. Now, if you think about it, just in general, if you were to store more food at today's prices, uh, you're probably not going to regret that down the road because if you think back, um, food was less expensive one, two, five, ten years ago than it is now. So it's highly unlikely that you're going to be paying uh, food prices two, three years from now saying, gosh, I wish I didn't store all that food because the food's so cheap. I don't really see that happening. Now, as you probably know, I, I like to end these current event podcasts with something more of an, on an upbeat level. And uh, this one caught my eye. Uh, it's Nissan's Leaf Charger will soon power your home for two days. Uh, they're talking about the, the car called the Leaf by Nissan. And what this is, is a new charger for, or a new power station for the Leaf to charge the Leaf. Uh, it does a couple things that um, the current chargers don't do. One of them is that it will charge the car up to 80% capacity in about four hours, which really isn't too bad. Um, but I, to me, more importantly, that this new charger will also be able to power the house for a couple days for typical usage. So um, the electric, electricity that's in the house uh, charges the battery, and you can use that battery to discharge into the car to charge the car. Or if the power goes out in your house, then that same battery can be used to feed the house power. And they're saying um, 6,000 watt hours of energy, which they say is a typical for a two days. Now, I suppose if you limited your use, you could probably get a lot more out of it. So... Um, for those people who have regular period, periodic power outages, like, like for example, my mom, uh, where she lives, and it's not like a rural area that you would expect this. This is a, a well-developed, old, uh, not so old that it has bad power lines, but it's it's a established, been around for a long time, suburban uh, neighborhood. Uh, the power goes out there regularly. So uh, she and... Um, her husband put in a uh, whole house generator and it, you know, it's great because when the power's out for 12, 24 hours, because a little thunderstorm rolled through, they've got power. Well, it's really loud. And instead of having this huge loud generator, you know, run for hours and hours and hours, uh, this pack could instead power. And I would assume it's mostly silent because it's basically just a, a big battery. So I thought that was kind of cool. And I, you know, it adds about $6,000. They're saying with the, uh, subsidies that you could probably get for it might be around 4,100, which isn't all that bad for a couple days of power. Now, uh, it's not a long-term solution for powering your house. But again, if you're in an area that suffers from chronic power outages that are less than 48 hours, typically, then this might be a, a good solution for you, of, of course, and assuming that you want to have a Nissan Leaf. And that'll pretty much do it for this podcast. I want to thank you for downloading and listening. If you'd like to reach us, you can go to the website at thepreparednesspodcast.com. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash preparednesspodcast. Follow us on Twitter as PrepCast. And of course, you can always email me directly at rob at prepcast.info. Until next time, enjoy life and be safe.